Today we embark upon the book of First Corinthians. We have finished First Thessalonians, then the book of Romans, then the book of Revelation, and the book of Hebrews. Now today we begin in chapter one of First Corinthians. Today in the Word. Good morning and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer. I'm so glad you're joining us here beginning 1 Corinthians. As we've already said, we've gone through a number of other books. And so if you've not looked through the playlist, be sure and do so. And if you don't mind, subscribe because we're going to be walking through this book. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time this morning and do a little setup uh, for this book because there's a lot to be said about Paul's effectiveness as he came into Corinth about A.D. 50. So he's writing this letter to them, and watch how he does. So many like the ancient writers, they would identify themselves uh, before they'd even say to whom they're writing to. So you can see here, Paul says that in verse 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes our brother. I like how Paul includes others. Like when he's writing other epistles, he'd say Timothy and Silvanus. He always included his team because he sponsored them like a real spiritual father, encouraging them to be seen as a vital part. Now, Sothenes, we're going to see, uh, was, I believe he's the same one in Acts 18, who was the ruler of the synagogue, who got beaten because he tried to protect Paul. You remember when Paul first came, uh, to Corinth, Crispus was the leader of the synagogue, and the scripture says, and he believed in his whole household. So uh, apparently Crispus had to resign or got kicked out, probably got kicked out. Uh, and then here goes Sothenes, and he gets converted. <laughs> it's like the gospel entered in to that way in such a powerful measure. You can see why people were upset at least the Jews were upset with Paul as he would come in and turn their world upside down by preaching the gospel. Now, he makes a statement here where he says, call to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Now, that's important because he's telling them, what I'm going to be talking to you about is by the will of Christ. And I wasn't appointed to this. I wasn't elected to this. And so he identifies his apostleship as he comes. Now, we're going to find out he stayed there according to Acts 18, about 18 months, about a year and a half. He had great fruit, very fruitful ministry, and probably had already written a letter uh, to the Corinthians because you will see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now, this is 1 Corinthians, yet he's saying, I wrote to you. So there had to have been an earlier letter that apparently has gotten lost, and he's relating to that as he goes through it. So it seems as though Paul has received reports because he says in verse 11 of chapter 1 that from Chloe's house he had gotten some reports of about problems that were taking place. And so he addresses these areas of conduct. They're, um, he calls them mere men, really carnality. He addresses their, their spiritual order that's needed. He addresses the gifts. He addresses a whole lot of issues, uh, sexual immorality. He, I, that's what I like about the book of Corinthians. It's so practical. And so he's answering those questions. It, it seems like they either wrote him or sent a delegation with questions because when you get over into chapter 7, he even says, now concerning the things which you wrote to me. And he begins to identify. So there are certain things that they wrote to him. So he's answering these questions. Maybe he wrote a letter and they wrote back. And he's responding here in 1 Corinthians to these reports. So he's wanting them to know he's coming to them as one who's commissioned by God, called to be an apostle, he says. Or it could be say called an apostle. Not to be. That was added by the translator. So it would be called an apostle. So Paul knew he was not one of the 12. There's a lot of uh, thoughts, well, maybe Paul was supposed to be been one of the 12 and he took Judas's place. No, no, no. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, he stood up with the 11. And so the Holy Spirit affirmed Matthias's place that he took Judas's. That was of the Lord. God directed them in that selection. And we have 12 apostles of the Lamb. I want you to see this. We have Christ, who's the apostle, 
Then we have the 12 apostles of the Lamb, and then we have post-ascension apostles, which Paul was of that, as well as James, the brother of our Lord, and many other apostles. And I'm not teaching on that today, or we would name them all, but you'll see them in the scriptures, many of them named. So in the work that's given here, we've got to see that Christ was the apostle. He is apostolos. That's that Greek word. He was sent. He was commissioned by the Father. The Son was sent as the apostle, Hebrews 3. Then Jesus selected and appointed his 12 called the apostles of the Lamb. There are not going to be any more apostles of the Lamb. So when we talk about apostolic ministry today, we're not categorizing it in the same way of the apostles of the Lamb because those had qualification requirements to be eyewitness of Jesus from the time of John the Baptist until the resurrection. Well, even Paul didn't fit into that. We'll discuss that later too, but he didn't fit into that. He came later after that. But we know that he had a commission that was equal to the 12. And how do we know that? Because Paul said in Galatians that when he went up and submitted his doctrine, submitted the gospel as he preached in vain, he says in chapter 1 of Galatians, verse 18 and 19, then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now that tells us that James, the Lord's brother, is called an apostle, and yet James, the Lord's brother, was not of the original 12. <laughs> In fact, he didn't even become a believer until after the resurrection. So we know that there are apostles other than the 12 and other than Paul. Now, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul references, again, that he says, but from those who seem to be something, talking about when he went up and presented himself after many years, and he's talking about the original 12, he says, what they were, it makes no difference to me. Now, he's not being smart, Alec. He's just saying God's no... Favor, per, no, no uh, preference of persons. He shows no favoritism. He says, God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. But on the contrary, in other words, they saw something on Paul. But when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcision was to Peter. Notice he said, those original 12 saw my commission was to the Gentiles, just like Peter's commission was to the Jews. Listen to what he says here. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. So he's saying the commission, and this is why we can say the commission that Paul had was equal to the 12, though it wasn't one of the 12. That, I believe that's why he had the authority to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And apostles of the day don't have commission equal to that. That was a commission that was needed to open up the work to the Gentiles. Now, even though Peter was given the keys of the kingdom, and I know that's through the gospel for all of us, yet literally Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and opened up the kingdom to the Jews, and then in Cornelius' house stood and preached to the Gentiles, and it was the first entry of the Gentiles, but Paul was the one commissioned with the authority to go to the nations or the Gentiles. So Paul's making that statement, I'm an apostle by the will of God, not by man. And then he includes uh, Sothenes, our brother, of course, as we just mentioned a while ago. Now he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Again, that word to be there is italics. It could be said, called saints. So let me read that again. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus our Lord, both theirs and ours. So he's addressing the church, Corinth, but he's saying also we identify with all who are believers. Now, the reason this is important is because when he says to the church of God, now, in his day, the word church would not have all the baggage that it has with us. When we hear the word church, I'm not sure what you think of. A lot of people think of denominations. They think of the Catholic Church. They think of buildings. They think of this and that. But the word church was not even a religious term. It was a secular term. And in the Greeks, it was a common term, meaning people who are called to a special assembly for a purpose, like a parliament or authority, to represent a government. 
So the people were called, not just people, but they were called for specific representation of authority. So that whole idea of the ecclesia, which is the Greek word, is, was not the, the word. Now, we probably shouldn't even use the word church today. We probably should, should use the word congregation or assembly because I don't know what goes on in people's minds. But it really was a non-religious word. It had a Gentile background. It had a Jewish background. The Jews would have used that in the Septuagint. It would have been the God's people. You would see that in Acts 7.38 when it says the church in the wilderness. It would be the same thing the people who are called together by God. And it had the idea that it was a special calling within the city for a pur purpose to accomplish something with a government like parliament. And so because it was this citizenry of gathering, Paul added to this citizenry of gathering of God, <laughs> the church of God, the ecclesia of God. So this is not a worldly group. This is not, this is not open to everybody. This is open only to God's people. So then he adds to that as well. He says, all those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now you're going to see these Folks don't seem too sanctified. They're mere men. They're walking in carnality. They're division. They're dividing. They're sexual problems. And yet they're called saints. They're called sanctified. Why? Because that in itself is foundational in our understanding of the work of Christ. That's why he adds to that, with all in every place who call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. <laughs> So he broads his perspective with the church, say, wait a minute, it's not only which is at Corinth. Now, I want to take a little moment here and talk about Corinth itself because it would have been any like any one of our modern cities in the United States, uh, prosperous and busy with commercial and also full of sin and worldliness because the gospel had not gotten there. Judaism wasn't there to a large degree, even though they had synagogues. It was still very much influenced by the Greek and the Romans and that what was going on. So to be like a Corinthian or to live like a Corinthian was a debauchery. It was sexual immorality. That was a common term. Just like in Vegas, we call it our, a sin city, city of sin. It's a sin city. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know, it's like that was Corinth itself. My wife and I had the privilege a number of years ago on our uh, first and only sabbatical was such a blessing to be able to go on that sabbatical. We went on a Mediterranean cruise, and while there, we were able to go to Corinth. And I was deeply moved by Corinth. Of all the places I have been, and I've had a privilege of going to uh, the Holy Land in Palestine, I don't think I was moved emotionally as much as I was there at Corinth, knowing when they excavated their, the ancient city of Corinth. And I've got some pictures I'll show you. It was so meaningful to stand right there on the stone, which would be the center of the city where official business was taking place, and Paul preached right there. And there's inscribed on the stone one of his, what's in the scripture, that these light afflictions cannot be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. And it was from that point, there before the temple, that he was preaching and where he wrote about meats being offered to idols because that was the place that people could have come when they're hungry and gotten free meat or very cheap meat because meat was being offered to the idols and there's so much left over it was like barbecue all the time it was like meat was available you could come get it very cheap or free and for some people it was their only means of getting meat and so that's why he said which we'll talk about later don't put on your conscience on someone else because if they go there and they're not bothered by that, let it be, you know. Uh, don't transgress their conscience. Uh, but in that whole city, you know, he would have come there about A.D. 50. Uh, this city had been um, in, constructed about 150 years before Jesus came. Uh, it was destroyed, and about 100 years later, uh, Caesar rebuilt it. And so here it was in its thriving uh, means and geographically it was in a narrow isthmus which was about four miles wide uh, and they would bring ships to one side from Athens and unload them on carriages and pull them across this four mile track and load them back up on ships otherwise they had to go all the way around the Cape of Malia which was very dangerous 
And it was known in those days, if you go around that cape, you might not ever survive. That's how dangerous it was. And it was a very long, laborious journey. I have no idea how long the shipping would be, but it would be forever. So they would unload the ship and carry them across. Now there is what's called the Canal of Corinth. And my wife and I had the privilege of going through that. And literally, they use it today for boats to go through. And it's about 79, I think it's 79 feet wide. <laughs> and literally, there was a cruise ship that went through once that was 75 feet wide. It's amazing. But it's used to get uh, some boats through even today. But it was, it, it was built many years ago for that, for that reason. Uh, but in those days, it wasn't there. So they had to unload the cargo and carry it over. But, but it, because it was right there, Corinth was right there, that was the center of trade. And the museum that we went to, uh, you could go to it today, it was evidence of all kinds of debauchery that was going on. Um, I won't get into all of that, but you could actually go into a museum and see some of the graffiti and some of the body parts that were celebrated because they had over a thousand prostitutes working in that temple. And so we're talking about a major uh, lifestyle that Paul would have entered into not unlike some of the cities or some of the places we find ourselves in today that needs the gospel. So it's really important for when he writes to the church that the church sees who they are, why some of the problems that they were facing, and as they grow up in that, he's saying to them, grace and peace to you from God the Father. I believe we're going to see the need for the gospel so clearly as we go through 1 Corinthians. I love this book for a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons is that we can relate. We can identify with the need of the community in the city in which we live in order that the gospel goes in and takes ordinary people with messed up lives and transforms them. That's why I want you to walk through this with me today in the Word.